She Who Laughs Last by Jenny Classel, read by Kani Puka of Kani Puka Productions. Prologue Lady Sira Dion had long ago concluded that you couldn't order up people by design. She herself was no fairy tale princess, all knobby knees and sharp elbows and peculiar eyes, neither blue nor green but an annoying hazy in-between color, and nondescript pale hair so straight and thick that no amount of crimping could tease it into the ringlet so much in fashion. The likelihood of her turning into a raving beauty was not all that promising. Oh, there were handsome men about, of course, but in Sarah's admittedly limited experience, a chivalrous gallant with golden hair curling about a noble brow, eyes blue as sapphires, and bewitching little dimples, was more likely to be gazing at his own reflection in a looking-glass than admiring her. A fairy-tale Prince Charming presented an even greater problem. To expect charm as well as beauty in one man without a surfeit of insufferable conceit was asking altogether too much of the good lord. The prince who rode through the gate of her father's manor house one bright autumn morning in Sira's thirteenth year certainly didn't look very charming. He looked downright forbidding as he sat ramrod straight upon a sleek Arabian stallion and took in the scene before him in one cool, appraising sweep of his golden eyes. By all accounts, Prince Jabril was not held to be a handsome man. During the days preceding the royal family's visit, Sira had been too embarrassed to seek details of his appearance from her mother or her governess. She was left with the dubious word of servants that the prince was stern of countenance and, here began the tittering, a man of noteworthy size and possessed of legendary stamina. Sira had not been impressed. So the man was tall, strong, and could run or swim long distances. What of it? Any number of men she knew merited that description. Her own ancestors, who had sailed in their great ships from the far north to settle on the island now known as the Dominion, were reputed to be giants. The prince dismounted with the easy grace that bespoke his years commanding the military forces of the crown. Lord and Lady Dion stepped forward to welcome the royal family to the hall of the Ninth House. Sira hung back, shy, hoping to pass unnoticed in the crowd, but her father beckoned her forward to be introduced to King Ahriman, the lovely Queen Alia, and Crown Prince Jabril. It was then, as he bowed over her hand, that this forbidding prince suddenly and astoundingly metamorphosed into the most beautiful man Sira had ever seen. She could not have been more surprised had the mythical sorcerer Merlin dropped straight from the sky into the courtyard, waving a golden wand and muttering arcane incantations. Banished instantly and forever was the shining knight of Sira's childish dreams. In his place entered the dark warrior. No maiden's dream, this prince, but a man inexplicably thrilling whose power enveloped her and sent a curious warmth spiraling from the top of her head to the tips of her toes. A flock of fluttering golden butterflies took roost in her heart. Little frogs leapt about in her belly. The tiny feet of mice skittered along every nerve. As though from a great distance, she heard a deep voice inquire, "'Are you quite well, my lady?' Perhaps the heat is too much for you? Sarah froze. She must answer the prince. But what if she opened her mouth and nothing came out? What if she started babbling in some unknown tongue? What did one say to a man who, just moments before, had been a mere curiosity, but now assumed the consequence of the man at the center of her whole world? Quite well, your highness. She managed to reply, almost snatching her hand from his as she backed away smack into her little brother, Eben, 
who let out a loud squawk and shoved her forward again, right into the prince's arms. Sira died a thousand deaths as the prince set her firmly on her feet, ruffled her hair, and strolled on into the hall with the rest of the royal party. Spitting mad, Sira whirled on Evan. You little monster! Look what you did! I will never forgive you! Never! I'll get you for this! She burst into tears and tore across the courtyard to the stables, where she huddled in her secret spot in the hayloft and agonized over every moment of her meeting with the prince and her subsequent humiliation at the hands of her detestable little brother. She did not emerge until the pipes sounded the summons to the midday meal, but while everyone else headed toward the great hall for the welcoming feast, Sira crept up the back stairs to her small chamber, and, for reasons she did not fully understand, cried herself to sleep beneath the covers of her trundle bed. During the three days that the royal party stopped at the hall of the ninth house, Sira could not decide whether she wanted Prince Jabril to notice her or not. One moment she was praying he would, and the next, with equal fervor, praying he would not. For the most part, she hugged the shadows, lurking behind pillars, peering around corners, ducking behind Merlins on the parapet to watch him best all comers in wrestling and swordplay. He hadn't taken any notice of her, of course. Why should he? At thirteen, she would seem a child in his eyes, invisible amidst an entourage of grand ladies with real bosoms, seductive smiles, and exquisite finery. He was hardly likely to pay attention to an awkward girl garbed in the modest, high-necked gown of a maiden, who was not even allowed to pin up her hair, but was still wear it loose or woven into a long braid. That was not the worst of it, for even young maidens could pass among the grown-ups, giggling and blushing, to be remarked upon, complimented, and teased. Sira, on the other hand, had to be ordered by her mother to attend the festivities in the great hall. Shyness, at the thought of Prince Jabril, turned to out-and-out -out panic whenever she found herself in his vicinity. She begged to be excused when her father and mother insisted she present herself before the company, and escaped at the earliest opportunity to the enchanted kingdom she had created among the rolling hills and thick woods of her father's lands. There, Sira was not the gawky girl whose bosoms were still but rounded little mounds surmounted by rosy nipples as small as tea roses, whose neck and legs seemed entirely too long, her eyelashes too short, her nose too freckled. Although her governess assured her that she looked every bit as she ought for a young lady who had become a woman only a few months before, Sira knew, just knew, she would never be the beauty her mother was. But in her own kingdom, she could be child or woman as she chose, princess or gypsy, a golden carp, a soaring eagle. So it was, on the afternoon of the last day of Prince Jabril's visit to the Hall of the Ninth House, that the Lady Sira could be found, and she certainly hoped she would not be, thereby incurring her father's serious displeasure, sprawled amidst tall, aromatic grasses far from the great house. She had spent the past hour memorizing the shapes of clouds, so that when they floated around again some day, she would have them fixed firmly in her mind. Her father had taught her that clouds were not just one shape or another, and were constantly blowing away or falling as rain, but Sira still wanted to believe the ancient tale of her ancestors that told of a goddess who wove the clouds into beautiful shapes from threads of purest silver. Tiring of that game, Sira imagined she captained a full-rigged catch, sailing around the convoluted edge of an island cloud, deciding which bay was likely to have pirates lurking in wait, which would shelter the ships of the great navy of the Dominion. Then she set sail across a placid sea toward even more distant island clouds, 
and the sapphire waves rocked her into sweet slumber. An hour later, Sira's eyes popped open as the first drops fell. Gone were the goddess at her loom, the lurking pirates, the sapphire sea. Instead, she stared up into a leaden sky and rain that fell in quick light drops now, but promised to come down in great slanting sheets any minute. She shot to her feet, hoping to outrun the storm, then realized she must be at least a mile away from the great house. She would be soaked by the time she reached it, and she wouldn't be able to sneak up the back stairs without being seen. She started out at a brisk trot toward a distant stand of trees, then broke into an all-out run as the roiling clouds let loose a torrent. She loved running like this, free beneath the sky, her hair streaming out behind her, with her heart beating in cadence with the stinging drops against her face. Forgotten were the dire consequences of her disobedience in the sheer exultation of the moment. She saw the horse just as she reached the bottom of the hill. She skidded to a stop in the wet grass and froze. Nothing on earth was going to propel her across the final hundred feet that would bring her beneath the sheltering canopy of the dark wood. There could be no doubt about that sable stallion. A magnificent beast, a mount fit only for a prince.